I don't think anyone in the world could hold up their hands and say that they're actively trying to drink more alcohol. We felt like we were losing time on the weekends. We were waking up from work feeling rubbish. I just felt like I wasn't reaching my full potential and it was starting to really get to me. The second you say, actually, I'm not drinking or I don't drink anymore, they're like, why? What's wrong? What's going on? You know, is something wrong? It got to a point where we felt like, is alcohol worse? What is going on here? There's something, is there a gas leak? No, there's no gas in the house, it's all electric. Oh my God. Today, I've got the pleasure of introducing you to Joelle Drummond, co-founder of Drop Bear Alcohol Free Beer Company. Just wait until you hear their story. From choosing to quit the booze, to brewing alcohol-free beer in their kitchen, to opening the UK's largest alcohol-free brewery. I am in awe of these women, and I know that you will be too. So, hello Joelle, how is Sunny Wales? Hi Michelle, yeah, um, I'm sorry to report that Sunny Wales is um, not so sunny, surprise, surprise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shocker there, yeah. So thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. I am really excited about our conversation. I would love to start at the beginning. So I think my first question to you is, how did you and Sarah, your co-founder and partner, meet? I love a love story and I love starting with this question. Yeah, and to be fair, it is a fair question given that we come from, you know, completely different sides of the world. Um, so Sarah is a originally from Australia, Melbourne to be specific. After I finished my first degree at about, what was I, 24 years old, I believe, I had what I like to call my quarter life crisis. I was super into my degree, loved everything about it. And then once it started to wrap up, I realized, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do in my life. Like what's next? Because my life had been pretty much laid out up until that point, you know, it's, it's school, it's college, it's uni. And then it's, okay, maybe go get a job, maybe do this, maybe do that. Shall I travel? Shall I do a gap year? Shall I go back to uni and do something else? Like, I was just completely overwhelmed. So I did the only logical thing and I ran away to Australia, <laughs> um, <laughs> as you do. So I was supposed to stay in Australia for about six months before moving on to China. But I met Sarah pretty early on and my plans very quickly changed. So um, like all millennials these days, we met on the internet. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think as soon as we met, we just knew there was something very special there. So Drop Bear really began all the way back in 2016, if you think about it. And it really is um, a little bit of a love story. That's amazing. I love it so much. And what was your life like together back then? In Australia, our life was very different to what it is now. So we both worked full time. Sarah worked out in the country in Gippsland and I worked um, in hospitality, which anyone who, work, who has worked in hospitality would know that it's quite a heavy drinking culture. It's not the most sociable hours either. So it's often uh, that you're finishing very late, having a few pints, wandering home early hours in the morning and sleeping half a day away so um that was work and then on the weekend it was very much you know we go out to the country we go to vineyards we go to maybe some breweries do brewery tours go to craft beer bars so our early dating life at least that first year in australia really was very much focused around alcohol which I know is pretty normal and to be honest at that point in time it felt very normal but I think it's as our relationship progressed as we started to get a little bit older that we we started to look at that a little differently. Yeah I can completely relate I did the whole kind of bar thing for a while yeah uh, was working in bars for a long time and uh yeah, my whole kind of dating life, socializing well into my 20s was exactly the same. You know, all good times revolved around a drink, unfortunately. When did you begin to question your relationship with alcohol? Sarah and I were together for a year in Australia and my visa ran out. So we had a decision to make quite early on in our relationship. And that was, OK, either it was just a one time kind of one year thing. That's it. Or we can, you know, take a risk and Sarah can move to the other side of the world with me and we can just see how it goes. And um, I'm really glad to say that it worked out and uh, Sarah took the plunge and she moved to Wales with me. 
So we were living in Wales and again, our social life very much reflected that of us in Australia, going out to bars, pubs, especially in the UK, you know, we love a good pub, don't we? Um, drinking a lot, you know, Friday night, finish work, have a glass of wine, have a bottle of wine, why not? It's Friday. Um, so it was very much in 2018, we were both working full time and we had quite... I, I don't want to say stressful lives because as business owners now, when I look back, that was an absolute dream and I should have appreciated it more. But at the time, in the context of our lives, that felt quite stressful. So, you know, in the evenings, we'd have a, a beer or wine, a glass of wine, and we'd go out on weekends with friends down Wine Street, Swansea. If you don't know, it has a, a famous street called Wine Street. And it's it's great because you can have really cheap night out and you can basically stumble from one bar to another, which is really bad, I guess. But as a young student, that's fun at the time. Yeah, yeah, it has its place. Um, so, yeah, we were drinking a bit. I wouldn't say a ridiculous amount, but it got to a point where we felt like, is alcohol worse? And the answer was yes. It, it wasn't so much that we, we felt that we were alcoholics. We had serious issues of alcohol it was very much just what is this added to our life or what is it taking away from our life you know we very we felt like we were losing time on the weekends we were waking up from work feeling rubbish and then you know having to go through the whole work day feeling rubbish already at the start just makes everything worse it just kind of snowballs doesn't it sarah was the one actually to decide to to stop drinking she didn't know if that would be a permanent lifestyle change or just temporary. And obviously living together, I decided to join her. It was very supportive, you know, as you are, as you would be. And I didn't, again, I didn't want to sit there and just drink on my own. That felt very different. And again, for me, drinking was more about the social occasion. So immediately that was like, okay, well, that's gone now. So I guess I'll stop too. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's a similar sort of experience for me as well. I think it was just gradually over time, you know, the hangovers got worse. I had two young children and I just felt like the hangover, the anxiety, um, the, the brain fog lasted for days and I just felt like I wasn't reaching my full potential and it was starting to really get to me. Um, and then I decided to sign up for the Singapore Marathon uh, in 2022 and quit quit the booze whilst training and yeah, never look back. I don't think you realise sometimes how much of a negative impact alcohol can be having on your energy levels and your clarity until you remove it from the equation. You know, I think because I've been drinking pretty regularly since I turned 18. So we're talking about six, seven years before I started to quit. Um, so it's very normal, but then actually I realized, wow, I could actually feel like this every day <laughs> if I, if I stopped. So I completely get that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's just, and then if you ever did drink, yeah, I, I'd wound down my drinking that I was only drinking once a month or even less. And then even if I just had one or two glasses of wine, oh yeah. man, <laughs> like I felt so terrible. And it really kind of makes you realize that when you're doing that a couple of times a week, you kind of get used to the feeling of feeling mm. groggy and feeling just not well. And actually it's not normal. And when you stop for a longer period of time, you're like, this feels amazing. I never want exactly. to do that again. So what did your like early days of sobriety look like? We approached it rather naively, really, because I think we, we expected to just stop drinking, but everything else to stay the same, which I guess in an ideal world, that is the reality, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. We would still go out with friends, we would still go to family gatherings, but we were immediately othered um, and the social occasions just felt completely different to us. So for example, you know, your family is your family, you think they just will accept you regardless, but I think people are so intrusive and nosy. The second you say, oh, actually I'm not drinking or I don't drink anymore, they're like, why? What's wrong? what's going on you know is something wrong and it's like well even if there were maybe I don't want to tell you but you know there's not I this is just a decision I've made for my well-being and you know just please respect it you know you get called boring you get people trying to you know as the night progresses especially just try to force drinks on you um and you know when you go out with friends if, if you're stuck with a pint of orange juice, it's just not the same. And you end up going home earlier. So then you miss out. You miss out on half the night. And it was just, it got a bit lonely in the end because you stop going out. Because a night out, even if you're not drinking, doesn't tend to be cheap. 
So if you're going out, you're not really enjoying it, and then you're having an orange juice or a Coke, you're like, well, what's the point? I might as well just save the money for something else that I, I actually do enjoy. So it was quite lonely, and that really made us start to to look further afield and explore the market in a in a very different way to what we'd ever explored before. I love how you described it as lonely, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe that um, that that first kind of few weeks, month as lonely but you're really right um and there was two of you doing it okay <laughs> so yeah my husband again very supportive had the, you know was doing a little bit with me but still kind of had the occasional drink but yeah i i felt the same uh quite lonely and not included uh i was worried as well it, mine went quite deep i was started to worry that I was going to not be invited to things, that I wasn't likeable. Uh, even my own parents called me boring. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot of pressure as well. People don't take you seriously. It, it took a while for people to actually listen to what I was saying and start taking me seriously. And um, people just thought it was going to be a temporary thing. Uh, but eventually everyone kind of got into the into the groove and kind of accepted it but yeah similar kind of situation uh very frustrating when you go out and all you've got to drink is orange juice or water you know there's only so many glasses of coca-cola that you yeah. can drink you're ultimately like you're an adult you want something sophisticated to drink something that is a bit more mature something that tastes great that's not loaded with sugar so yeah i definitely felt lonely yeah in my first few few months for sure especially as someone who is a bit of a social butterfly i found it really hard considering how lonely we felt as a couple i can't even imagine what it would feel like as an individual person kind of going through that journey you know alone that that must be so hard but i, I think that is reflective of most people's experience isn't it what changes did you make to your lifestyle did you replace kind of the going out to the pub with something else you know to be honest the replacement was probably far healthier um we became a lot more active so we'd wake up earlier on the weekends we would do more road trips we do more hikes the dogs certainly enjoyed it a lot more because they were getting out for extended periods of time you know sometimes we get up at seven be in the car by eight we'd be coming back 9 p.m in the night and we would have been out hiking the whole day and maybe stop somewhere along the way for a nice meal it was i think we still managed to enjoy our time together but we felt especially at that time in our life in our early to mid 20s that most of our peers weren't really socializing in that way i think maybe if we'd been based in london there was already a fledgling sober community but you know coming from from South Wales, there was really nothing. It's it's very heavy on the drinking scene. While you were kind of in that space or kind of in that mindset and trying to figure things out, you identified a little bit of a need. Yeah. Right? So tell me a little bit more about how Drop Bear or the at least the idea for a non-alcoholic craft beer came about. Before Sarah and I started this journey, we neither of us had really even heard the term entrepreneur. So it wasn't something that was necessarily on our mind. That said, ever since we'd met, you know, years before Drop Bear came to be, um, we'd thrown around business ideas of all sorts. So um, I think we, we were both always destined to own a business and to, to create something that hadn't been done before, or at least in that way. But nothing really stuck. We, we literally still have a little notebook and it's got a list of business ideas and names and some of them have been hashed out a little more than others. But nothing felt quite right. So um, one day I was getting ready for work and Sarah, you know, the sobriety had been going on for a, about a month, so it hadn't been that long. But we had certainly started to really feel the, the change in our life. Uh, and Sarah said, well, what about, um, you know, what if we created an alcohol-free brewery, craft brewery, and started making alcohol-free craft beers? And despite the fact that I had been feeling the demand myself as a consumer, I, I don't know, I, I feel like I was still very ignorant to it, to it all and to other people's experience. And I said, no, nope, that's ridiculous. That's a really stupid idea. No one's ever going to buy alcohol-free craft beer. And that was that. I shut it down. I shouldn't have. Um, and that day I drove to work alone. She was working from home and I think it was a sign from the universe, honestly, on the radio that day, they were discussing the rise of alcohol free and sobriety and the, the market growth and 
how interesting it was and how rapid it was. So I thought, all right, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take the bait. Uh, I went to work, I was fully distracted and I started researching the market and thought, okay, right, maybe I was wrong. Went home that night with my tail between my legs and said, okay, maybe we should look at it. Maybe you're right. And um, she was. So the more digging we did, the more we realized it was the UK's fastest growing drinks trend. But not only that, it was, it really was a global movement and it still is. You know, I don't think anyone in the world could hold up their hand and say that they're actively trying to drink more alcohol. Everyone is trying to be healthier or moderate. And a lot more people these days are trying to cut it out completely for a myriad of reasons. So I acknowledge I was wrong. I can do it on occasion. <laughs> and um, we are very all or nothing people. So it really escalated very quickly. So that was, I don't know, sometime in the week. By the weekend, we had driven up to Bristol, which is about an hour and a half away from where we live. And we were in a home brewing shop, um, basically clearing out the shop, buying everything they had. We didn't have a clue really what we were buying, but we thought if we bought pretty much everything, we couldn't go wrong. We bought a 10 litre saucepan from the supermarket around the, the corner. And we got a pile of books from the local library and we started watching a ridiculous amount of YouTube videos. There's this random guy in Canada and I don't think he, well, he wouldn't. He has no idea the impact he's had on our life or the UK alcohol free drinks market because he was just, I don't know, literally not to be stereotypical of Canadians, but he was in a cabin in the woods <laughs> and um, snow everywhere. And he had this hob and he had a saucepan and he talked you through detail by detail how to brew uh, beer it was alcoholic but it was still a similar concept how to brew beer in literally one container and given the fact that we had like no money we couldn't go and just buy a brewery at that point so we needed to make it work in one saucepan so we learned a lot from him and the library and literally got to the point where it was so extreme we were brewing every day after work you know, we'd work nine to five, come home and brew into the night. And then we'd go to bed. We'd have these little demijohns bubbling away next to the bed because the beer was fermenting slightly. And I start, I actually started sleep talking. Um, and if anyone knows anything about brewing, they know how unexciting sparge water is. But I would literally shout in my sleep about sparge water and how many litres we needed to add to the brew because it was just so intense trying to absorb all this information in such a short period of time. But I think we felt so passionate about it that we just we just did it and we made it work. I don't really know how looking back, but we did. This is amazing. It's so good. So much to unpack yeah. here. Uh, first, I've got to ask you, like, what was this guy's name? Like, I need to look him up. I know, I have to find him because obviously I haven't watched him in, in about five, well, nearly five years now, actually. I'm thinking when we hit five years old, I'm going to have to drop him a line and just say, you don't have a clue who I am. I don't really know who you are, but thank you so much <laughs> for everything. Thank you for your videos. But uh, I'll get that name for you and send it over. That is honestly amazing. I'm always like blown away by the power of YouTube and what people can actually learn to do from here. Like it's, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And brewing, you know, it's very much a mix of science and art and you literally can learn anything on YouTube. I'm convinced it's, it's an amazing tool and highly recommend to anyone who's looking to learn a new skill, TikTok and YouTube are really great resources. <laughs> First of all, was it dangerous to be brewing this beer in your house? Did you have to leave these saucepans on all the time? Or So tell me a little bit more about the process. So it shouldn't have been as dangerous as we made it. Uh, we did have a couple of incidents, and I, I will tell you about those now. So I think the major issue we had was um, our stovetop was electric. So heating up the water, because we'd have like 10 litres of water nearly, the nearly boiling point when we were doing the hops, it took hours. So the whole process should have just taken a few hours. We're talking 14 hours plus it would take us. So it was a bit of a nightmare. And there was one time where we actually left it. We just, I don't know why we did this. I think we just really wanted to go, but we had booked tickets with our friends to go to a cheese festival. And we were like, I need that cheese. So we just left it on and we just risked it. And thank God when we got back, it was all right. Um, but like looking back again, I think just the, 
the fullness of youth, we just had far less worries. Like I would never do that now. I'd be worrying, is the house on fire, blah, blah, blah. But that, that wasn't too bad. The, the main issues we had, one of the first ways we experimented with producing alcohol-free beer was um, heat extraction. So this isn't a method we implement now, but what we thought was we'd brew the beer to a low alcoholic content, so maybe like 2% ABV, and then we'd reheat the beer up to the boiling point of ethanol, which is, I believe, 70 something degrees. So not boiling point for water, but just for the ethanol. So basically you burn off the ethanol and then what you're left with is alcohol-free beer. Sounds simple, it's not. And really no one does this in a commercial brewery because there are far too many variables. But what we did, again, coming back to that ridiculous hob and how long it took to get hot. So what we did, because it was winter, we closed all the windows, all the doors to get it up to boiling point. And eventually we did get there. And it all was good until maybe, you know, 20 minutes in, me and Sarah start feeling really unwell. We're just like, what is going on here? There's something, is there a gas leak? No, there's no gas in the house. It's all electric. Turns out we'd been hot boxing ourselves with pure ethanol. So whilst we were trying to become sober, we were absolutely smashed. <laughs> Just we were breathing in ethanol, and, you know, it's quite dangerous in large quantities. So all the windows opened and we learned from our mistakes. But uh, literally, if you had lit a match, that apartment would have gone boom. We are lucky neither of us smoke, but if there'd been a smoker around, they wouldn't have been around for long. So that was probably our biggest... It's <laughs> Looking back, we've got we're a lot more careful now, I've got to say. And we blew up a few glass demi johns. Again, we just really wanted to get all the cleaning right. We had like harsh chemicals and then we used water that was far too hot. So literally you just add it and just glass explodes everywhere. So um yeah, I did have glass in my foot for a little while. We couldn't get it out, but it's out now. And that's all that matters. <laughs> are you still in the same apartment we aren't, now? No, um, it was really lovely though. I have really fond memories of those chaotic evenings brewing away and then also, you know, warehousing the company in our living room. <laughs> so uh, it was oh, it was absolutely that's... ridiculous, but um, it was really fun. And so I actually don't know a lot about the process of brewing beer. Could you just take me through the steps and then how how you now remove the alcohol? Beer is made with four key ingredients. So the biggest ingredient in beer, alcoholic or not, is water. So having really good quality water is key. Um, if your water hasn't been treated properly, it can taste completely different to, to what it would be otherwise tastes like you've got grain or malt as we call it so you can have a variety of different malts some of them give biscuity flavors some taste like bread some taste like caramel some taste like coffee chocolate it's amazing what you can achieve by just roasting the the malt in different ways or treating it in different ways we don't do that we buy that in then you have hops they're essentially little buds they they look like little flowers so you can get those in whole head hops or little pellets and then the final ingredient that is often overlooked because it's not very sexy but it's very very important is yeast so yeast is key because that's what controls the fermentation and how much uh, alcohol you actually end up producing just adding different yeasts can give like different flavors to the beer so you can get more floral flavors banana flavors tropical fruit or you can just have a plain kind of flavor from the yeast that allows the other ingredients to shine. So that's what you start with. So the first process of brewing is, which is where you heat the water with the malt. Then you go to the boil, which is when you add in the hops. That's when more flavor and bitterness is added. Then it's transferred to a fermentation vessel where you add the yeast. So three key steps, very simplified mind because there are a lot of mini steps along the way, but um, it's a really nice natural process that's been developed over thousands of years. And, you know, the way we produce our beer is pretty much the same as it's always been made. So what we do is we do low fermentability work with arrested fermentation, which sounds a lot harder than it actually is. It basically just means we use slightly yes, less uh, malt so we get less sugars and then we control the fermentation to make sure that there is less alcohol. And that is literally it. So 
I think for us, we, we've always really loved beer, craft beer, the art of brewing. We've It's just really interesting. And I think as soon as you do a brewery tour, you're kind of sold. Everyone just loves it. So we were really passionate about brewing real beer. We didn't want it to just be a beer-like product. And we really wanted to protect and promote the art of brewing to a new audience or a developing audience. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer, wasn't it? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. I'm learning so much. And that's what that's what helped you guys retain like all the yeah, amazing I think for us, Um by following the traditional brewing process, we've been able to achieve the authenticity of flavour. I think the further away from the natural process you go, the harder it is to then achieve the same flavour. So yeah. So coming back to your sauce brim brew brew, can I call it a sauce brim brew? <laughs> <laughs> So once you guys had um, experimented with this and you'd got something that you really liked, how did you go from, okay, this is something we enjoy drinking to, okay, we should start selling this. And how did things progress? Before we even did the first brew, we had a very clear vision of what we wanted to achieve. So we, we always wanted this to go to market. This was never just for us. In hindsight, that could have just been nice. We could have just done it for us and kept it small and um, been less stressed. But we, we always knew we wanted it to go to market. So before we did the first ever brew, we actually did a lot of research into flavor profiles. What was popular, what wasn't, what was already being done. So we've taken a lot of influence from the alcoholic craft beer scene. And then we looked at what was going on in alcohol free craft beer, which was essentially non-existent at the time kind of pinpointed the major gaps and major opportunities and kind of crafted the recipes around them. So um, they were never supposed to be just things that we liked. But what we did was we got the recipes to a point where we thought, okay, well, we like them. But also we don't know if other people will like them. And we don't know if these recipes are scalable because brewing in a 10 litre saucepan, literally like this compared to, you know, 12 million cans a time, which is what we do now, is very different. And it's not just a matter of times in it by X to, to increase it. It's uh, There are a lot of variables to consider. So we have always acknowledged the gaps in our knowledge, which I think is really important as a business owner. You There is a temptation to do everything yourself because no one will care more than you, but you can't possibly ever know everything. And I'm happy to to always get good partners on board. So we actually got the ex Heineken brewer on board as a consultant. So he, he actually came to our house, <laughs> our tiny one bedroom apartment. Everyone's been there. And um, he, he tasted the beers. He listened to what we were trying to achieve, looked at our recipes. And he went away and he just tweaked a couple of things to make sure that when we went for that first commercial brew, they were ready and that they would achieve what we wanted. In the meantime, we did panel tastings with um, friends of family, friends of friends of friends, as many people as we could get for free. Again, we had literally no money. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, so it, everything was on a shoestring budget. And, um, you know, in, in an ideal world, we would have done more panel testing, got proper feedback and then gone to market. But unfortunately, that's not always possible for everyone. So we it was a risk, and um, but it did pay off. So no regrets. <laughs> wow, that is, uh, it's just, I can't, I, I'm just trying to get my head around it. Like, I am so inspired by you guys. Like, yeah, I mean, my husband are the same. We're like full of ideas, but have never had the courage to follow through or never had something that we felt so passionate about that we've gone all in. So how did you, once you had the product and everything was right, how did you start to scale? We started drop there with just the money that we had in our bank accounts, which in our early twenties <laughs> was virtually nothing. I gotta be honest. Um, I come from a very working class background. My mum just works in the supermarket. So very much didn't have like rich parents helping me out. Unfortunately, that would have been nice. Um, so we just had that. And we actually, we both quit our jobs and took out personal loans, which was a really big risk looking back. I'm thinking, when I look back and I think, wow, what if this had not worked out? We would have been in so much debt. <laughs> we would have had no income, but it did. So we, we threw everything, all the money we could get at it, all of our resource, all of our time. And as soon as we, we launched, the demand for the product and the brand was phenomenal. We 
we kind of expected it to grow quite quickly, but not like this. And we had a very early decision to make. So we could either say, okay, well, this is great, but we can't grow. So we're going to have to just rein it back in, maybe stick to some local smaller markets and just try to grow it very slowly, a bit more organically that way. Could take a couple of years, whatever. Or <laughs> we could try and hit it really hard and be like, what do we really want to achieve with this? And it's like, we want to make an international brand and we want to do it now. So that's the decision we made, which is probably the harder of the two, but I think the most rewarding for, for this. Um, this is definitely a place for smaller businesses, of course, but I don't think that would have been right for Drop Bear. So we, we were actually approached by an investor. So we'd approached all the banks that we could find. No one wanted to touch us. You know, two young women trying to make alcohol for a beer in a saucepan. No way. Um, <laughs> didn't care what the sales data told them. They thought we were absolutely mad. So um, we were kind of at the end of a road. We were like, oh my God, what are we going to do now? And then we got reached out to by a, an angel investor. So it was a gentleman who had been monitoring the, the market for a number of years. He was very interested in it, but he hadn't found a brand that he believed in. And he learned of our story. He tasted the beers. He, he really loved the branding. And he said, I'm in, I'm going to give you X and I'm going to help you run your first investment campaign because you need, you know, you know, you need money to make this work. Uh, again, we didn't have any experience. We didn't know really what a business plan was, a marketing plan, how to raise investment, really what that meant. It was quite overwhelming. We had to learn all these things very quickly, which, you know, we had to learn, so might as well get it done quickly. And we decided to run our first investment campaign on a website called Crowdcube, which is a crowdfunding equity platform. So essentially, people can invest as little as like ten pounds up to hundreds of thousands of pounds into your into your company. So we aimed to um, raise a hundred thousand pounds just as working capital, uh, which felt like such a massive amount of money at that time. And so we launched the campaign within 12 hours. It was fully funded. We had 30 days to achieve this and we did it in 12 hours. And we were just like, what? We were not prepared. Um, so we ran out to the supermarket in the middle of the night to get a bottle of alcohol free Prosecco to toast it. <laughs> uh, so we've got to celebrate. Um, but we actually had the option of keeping it open uh, a little longer. So we kept it open for a couple of days, I can't remember exactly how long, just over a week, and we got to 200,000. So we were 200% funded, and then we closed it. Uh, so obviously, we, we did give up some equity, but it was, it was necessary at that point in time. So following that, we did another investment campaign 18 months later, similar kind of story. However, we wanted to raise 500,000 pounds to build our own brewery. So the way the alcohol free market beer market at least operates generally is um it has an outsourced production model so most people in alcohol free beer use other people's breweries which definitely has its benefits but it also means it's very very challenging to to run a profit so we really want to drop out to be a long-term sustainable business and we thought okay we're going to swim against the tide we're going to do things a little differently sure it's going to be hard but to be honest raising money as two women, whilst I've made it sound easy, it really isn't. So that's what we wanted to do. So we, we opened another round. By the time we got to £300,000 funded, we actually got contacted by a billionaire um, who said he wanted to get involved. And we met with him a number of times. And then he came in and added uh, one and a half million pounds so our business just kind of went from here to here overnight and we had to grow up very quickly and we've since raised close to three million pounds now for Drop Bear. So that's how we've scaled. It's very much been about getting the money. You always need more money than you think. And in drinks, there's a lot of expenditure on marketing. So you need a good amount of cash in the bank. Um, so scaling with money, that's been key, but I think we've, we've had a good team around us and also we've always been very focused on the product. Um, I, I think a lot of people can end up wanting to just 
spend a lot of money, time and resource on, you know, controversial campaigns or doing things weird and wonderful, which is a place for. But I think just deliver, consistently delivering a really good product definitely has its merits and allows you to open doors, you know, that, that would otherwise be unopened. So I think you guys have got really, really Thank strong you. branding <laughs> as well, um, both in kind of the name and the visuals and then also in your brand story. How did you come up with Drop Bear? It's random. We actually spent a whole weekend locked in the apartment with a notepad and a pen. And we were like, because we couldn't come up with a name. And we were just like, all right, this is enough is enough. We just need to get this done. Uh, because like we had the recipes and but we didn't have a name and we didn't have any branding. So we were like, okay. So we came up with a massive list. None of them felt quite right. There's a couple I still quite like. Um, but we couldn't agree. So we gave up and we went to the supermarket uh, to get some food. And Sarah actually had been feeling a little homesick that weekend. So I don't know why, but it just popped into my head and I said, what if we called it Drop Bear? Because Drop Bear is very personal to us, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but she didn't believe me, she didn't think I was serious. I was like, you know, seriously, what if we called it Drop Bear Be a Co? And it just, the second I said it, it just like felt like it already existed somewhere in time, <laughs> and it did. Um, so that was it then. We just knew it was right, and then developing the visuals was just an absolute joy, to be honest, because we got to really bring it to life. Unfortunately, neither Sarah or myself can draw at all. <laughs> so we had a very clear idea of what we wanted, but we couldn't do it ourselves. And you don't want to see the attempts that we had. So we worked with an agency to to bring our visuals, our, our ideas to life, I guess. But basically, on our very first date, we were in this rooftop bar and Sarah said to me, have you seen any drop bears? while you've been here and I was like drop bears what are they because you know I'm sorry but everything in Australia is trying to kill you there are so many spiders snakes jellyfish shark everything you're gonna be scared of everything so I'd already been really nervous about all these things and I think she knew that and then she told me this whole long-winded story about drop bears and how dangerous they are and the risks and I fully believed it so I was going around for months telling people about drop bears and None of the Australians I encountered corrected me, so they're all laughing. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know, it's a an Australian joke that they uh, play on foreigners, saying that there are these basically angry, evil koalas, essentially, that drop down and attack people, which, you know, is believable. Like, I got attacked by a magpie twice <laughs> in Australia. So, you know, if a magpie can do it, why not a koala, which is a bit more exotic? So um, it's always been a bit of an inside joke and something that kind of symbolised our early journey and our time in Australia in a bit more of an abstract way. I think, for me, I wanted to get that personality across, but I didn't want it to be just about us. But I also didn't want it to be something super stereotypical. You know, like a kangaroo, a boomerang, or you know, something like that. So it's still Australian, but it's yeah, it's got a bit more to it. I love it. It's honestly so fun um, and memorable as well. It's something that really stands out on the shelf, um, and yeah, it's it's absolutely brilliant. We have a lot of fun. I think everyone's always like, "What a drop there!" So we get to tell them all the lies that Australians tell daily about <laughs> drop bears. What has been that your biggest challenges over the last few years? Oh, big question. I think any business owner would listen to that and be like, where do I start? You know, <laughs> I think I've already mentioned it, but raising finance, um, raising finance is a big challenge. I think for us as young women, we're very different to basically everyone in our market. Everyone is more or less centered in London and they're white men with a lot of connections, which, you know, good for them. But unfortunately, that's not our reality. So it's been a really hard slog. You know, generally for women, women get about 1% to 2% of VC funding annually anyway. So that's 98% men. So it's always it was always going to be harder. But I guess I didn't realise that when I started. And maybe if I had, I would have planned differently. But we, we managed. So that's been a challenge. I think a, a notable challenge as well um, is working with your wife. Um, 
which now is something I love and don't get me wrong it's been completely worth it and it is the most fulfilling thing because I am a little bit clingy and if Sarah goes off for the day without me I'm like I miss her where is she you know this is a waste of time <laughs> a waste of my life um so but I think early days that you know for the first two years of drop bet it was very much it was just me and Sarah doing everything it was really high stress high stakes we had we'd thrown everything into it and I think we bickered quite a lot um but I think as we've grown up as we've learned a lot more we've respected learned to respect each other a lot more and you know having other team members around us has forced us to become you know good leaders and has forced us into our more individualized roles I think initially again because we had no business experience we were just trying to get everything done together but now, you know, I'm the director of sales and marketing, Sarah's director of ops and finance, both very important roles that work together, but they're not stepping on each other's toes. So that's been a long journey, but five years in, we're, you know, we're still married, we're all good. <laughs> um, no dramas <laughs> now, but uh, early days, very much so. Another challenge we've had is finding a good brewery site. So we were looking for two years to, to establish our own brewery. So we looked all around the UK. We finally found something in our hometown of Swansea, just around the corner from where we actually started Drop Bear. And I think that's a really nice, a really nice way for the story to, I don't want to say end, but kind of come full circle because we're in a massive brewery. So it's 16,000 square feet internally with a massive yard. We can brew 1 million cans a year currently but this site has capacity for 25 million cans so it's just a matter of adding more tanks basically and more staff but yeah just getting that done learning how to set up a brewery again starting with a saucepan very different to having a brewery with carbonators and transfers and pumps and pipe work and again breweries are quite dangerous places lots of chemicals lots of high pressure vessels you know you got to be, you've got to learn, you've got to do things right. So that's been a, a big one. Wow. Yeah, I wouldn't know where to yeah, start. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Like that. <laughs> I suppose you've got all that beautiful Welsh water as well, which probably contributes to your amazing product. Like, there's got to be a benefit to raining all the time, hasn't there? So, uh, yes, we, we never run out of water. <laughs> I absolutely love Drop Bear's brand story and your mission and positioning. It really, really resonates with me. So I'll just kind of reel a couple of things off. So you want to be the world's first carbon neutral, alcohol free beer. You're lacto free, gluten free. You want to continue the great tasting craft beer, women owned, inclusive brand. You want it to be a fun experience to drink. Am I missing anything? What else do you hope for Drop Bear? Well, we're also B Corp certified. I think that's got to be, that's got to be it, surely. Like, what else can we do? I don't know. <laughs> I think, yeah, for us, it was always very important to create a product and a brand that had the potential to go mainstream and to create an experience for drinkers or non-drinkers, I should say, that made them feel like they were still having a really great experience that they weren't being other, that they were still enjoying craft beer. And it doesn't sound like a big deal, but you, with the emails we receive from customers, you'd be absolutely amazed at the difference this can make to some people's lives. Like for example, we had a customer the other week who emailed saying they've been going through cancer treatment and um, recently they've been very, very unwell. They haven't left the house. And they've recently started to feel a little better. So they've started to socialize a bit. And uh, she went to the pub with her, down her local pub with her friends and they had drop bear on the bar. And she said, just being able to sit there and have a beer with friends just meant the world to her. And it was that le degree of normality that she was craving. And there are so many people like that for so many different reasons. So it, re it really is so important. Yeah, and that is exactly why I wanted to talk to you today. I feel so passionate about the category and about non-alcoholic alternatives because they were this huge bridge for me. My barrier with sobriety wasn't me wanting or craving alcohol. Like I did not want to drink yeah. anymore. My barrier was, was the socializing. I wanted to stay, it was how I stay connected to like my friends and my family and even my husband yeah. and having those moments and sharing those moments over a drink and relaxing with a drink and celebrating with a drink. And 
you know, I didn't want to be excluded from those yeah. moments just because I didn't want to put alcohol in my body anymore. And when I discovered, started to discover non-alcoholic alternatives, I got absolutely obsessed with the category because I just, every drink that I tried, I was just blown away by how, um, how much they mimicked alcohol, how I felt included when drinking with friends, having a glass of non-alcoholic wine in my hand was, was enough to squash any of those feelings of, uh, being excluded or, and so on. And yeah, I think having something sophisticated to drink, something adult to drink, something that wasn't full of sugar and full of calories, it it changed everything for me and it allowed me to be, it allowed me to continue with my sobriety and it has made sobriety yeah. easy, you know, uh, because I get to still have those moments that are incredibly meaningful for me um, just without that's so great to hear and that's literally why we exist you know i just feel like you shouldn't have to miss out you know you can choose to not go to these occasions if you find them triggering or too difficult but if you want to go you should still be able to go and enjoy it and also just have something that tastes looks feels the same and again especially i found for men they like to have a pint of beer not necessarily in a can or a bottle that specifically says it's alcohol free, but if they can sit with their mates with a pint of beer, it looks like beer, smells like beer, no one's going to be checking. Um, but they don't even have to tell people yeah. if they don't feel comfortable. And it's just giving people more options and more freedom to, to do that. Totally. And um, I was at a party not that long ago and um, my husband wasn't drinking that day either. And uh, I walked up the stairs with two glasses of non-alcoholic wine and I uh, crossed a drunk guy on the stairs and he just looked at me and he goes, oh, double parked, yeah. way. And um, I just looked at him and went, way. Yeah. <laughs> and just like walked past. And I was like, I got to have like a silly moment with somebody that, you know, if I was walking up with two glasses of water, he probably would have gone, oh, yeah. why are you not drinking, you know? And it was just really, it was just actually quite funny to have that moment and he felt comfortable, I felt comfortable and yeah, it was good. Those moments of connection are so important though. And again, it comes back to that loneliness, doesn't it? You know, you could have gone to that party, but you could have been very obviously sober and the way people acted towards you would have been completely different. So I totally get what yeah. you're saying. Double parked. <laughs> It's double park. And it's um it's always really funny because often when people uh, when you say to somebody, Oh, I don't drink or I'm not drinking, they it makes them question their own drinking and their own alcohol and you know, should they be drinking, are they drinking too much? And there's definitely like a level of discomfort from drinkers there. And so sometimes, you know, I think even just even if they know you're not drinking, but they see you with a non-alcoholic beer or non-alcoholic wine, I just think subconsciously it puts them at ease and they feel a bit more comfortable with their decision to drink. So, you know, I think it works both ways Definitely. as well. I think it can be really confronting for people who aren't on that same journey and people can get very offended. And it's just not something I ever considered before being in that position myself. But yeah, it's a really good point. And it's, I've noticed that so many of my friends and family now have like really cut down on their drinking. And I think growing up, I didn't know a single person who didn't drink, you know, and I'd, every single person in my life had a good time with a drink. Fun, fun was going to the yeah. pub, you know. And But what's happened now is that my parents, my sister, my husband, my friends, they're all drinking less in part because I'm introducing them to the great non-alcoholic alternatives. But I think it's just also becoming much more like socially acceptable to choose a non-alcoholic alternative. And not to blow my own horn at all, but I do think that the market developing and having these, you know, actually these days, really nice tasting options, really funky brands that are actually genuinely interested has helped shift the view of sobriety or just alcohol-free beverages generally it, it can be nice it can still be a nice drink it can still be fun it can still be interesting whereas before it there was either nothing or it was you know it was a compromise it doesn't it doesn't have to be anymore honestly absolutely and again that's why I'm so excited to talk to you because it's 
you've really disrupted the category, but you've done it with a really great product as well. Um, so uh, you've got your four craft beers. You can tell us a little bit about each of them. Uh, but also, I really like when we spoke previously about the craft beer experience, you know, being able to taste, uh, you know, maybe even do some tastings and things like that and still have that same experience that you do with regular craft beers. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Genuinely, so much thought and attention has gone into them. And I think that's what can really make the difference between a specialist producer of alcohol-free beer and maybe an alcoholic producer who just does one maybe because they feel like there's an opportunity or they just should. We have four. They're all vegan, gluten-free, low-calorie, carbon-neutral. I won't list the rest, but that should be enough. Um, and what we've done is we've tried to create a range that's relatively concise because, again, we just want to consistently deliver quality. And that is easier with a, a smaller range. So we've got four, but we've tried to cover a variety of styles, hitting the, the key points in the market that people are, are looking for. So our New World Lager, we wanted to create a craft lager. So it's an India Pale Lager which means it's slightly more hoppy than something like a Bex. And it's completely hopped with specialty hops from New Zealand. So whilst it tastes like a lager, it's got these really interesting notes that you don't always get in a normal lager. So you've got like candied citrus fruit, biscuit, honey. It's just very delicate, but it's there. And if you, you know, you can just sit there and you can kind of taste it, sip it, analyze it look at where the hops are from the provenance of it all it's just like really interesting and i think all beer styles have so much potential to add a lot of value to the drinking experience lager is often seen as just oh that's just a lager whatever but no <laughs> our lager is an india pale lager then we've got our yuzu pale ale again when we were designing this this is one of the first beers we did there were a couple of pale ales in the market so we didn't want to just do a pale ale we wanted to do a fruited pale ale but something that wasn't too weird and wonderful something that most people would find palatable to a pale ale so usually you get lemony flavors with pale ales so what we decided to do was utilize the yuzu fruit so not sure if everyone's familiar with that it looks kind of like a big fat ugly lemon that's fallen off the back of a lorry it's not a very attractive fruit but it is lovely tastes a bit like a combination of grapefruit, lemon and lime. So it's got a really nice tart flavour to it, but it has a really nice complexity to it as well. It's not just tart. You can pick out different notes of the fruit. And it's just beautiful. So we have that in our pale ale and that's balanced really nicely with notes of biscuit and toffee from the malts. So it's almost kind of like this yuzu cheesecakey thing going on. It's really nice. It's, we call it the perfect summer drink. It's really refreshing. It's nice and tart. None of our beers are sweet because there are lots of overly sweet alcohol-free beers out there. We wanted to create something that real craft beer drinkers are going to love. And it's just having that typical beer bitterness. Nothing that will blow your head off, but something that you would expect in a beer. So that's the Pale Ale. The Tropical IPA, that's my personal favourite. That's the purple one. So that's got four hops in it. All of the hops come from the US and the US has a climate that allows for lovely tropical fruit notes to develop in the hops. So we've got a variety of four hops and um, we hop about four times, so three times during the brewing process. Then we hop later in vessel, dry hopping that's called. So you crack open a can and the smell is just beautiful. It just smells like peaches, pineapple, citrus, mango. It's just, it's lush. We say that in Wales, lush. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. But you taste it and you think, oh, is this going to be super sweet because it's tropical? But no, again, because it's a West Coast style IPA, we've ensured that we've still got that prominent hot bitterness. So whilst it's fruity, it's nice and crisp. It's got a little bit of bite. And it's just a really memorable drink. And I think that's one of the, it's probably the beer that when we do blind tastings with the most, people just don't know it's alcohol free because they associate that hoppiness, that bitterness with alcohol. When actually the taste of alcohol mostly is warmth in the back of your throat. Mind you, being, I'm pretty much sober to be honest. 
if I ever do have any alcohol, I can really taste it now. But if you drink it regularly, you don't. So that's our biggest seller. And then last but certainly not least is our bonfire stout. I love this one. It's our love child. It, it was really hard to get it right, but we got there in the end. And again, that just showcases the power of malt. I think in craft beer, everyone focuses on hops a lot, which fair enough, they're really exciting and it is cool. But malts are really cool too. <laughs> I sound like such a geek tonight. Um, but we've got this specialty German malt in the stout that comes from this one town in Germany and it's uh, open roasted over flames. And it's just got this really smooth but complex smokiness to it. So again, it's not just a dark beer that just has a beer flavour. You get notes of espresso, smoke, dark chocolate. It's just, again, you, you can sit there, you can do food pairings, you can analyse it. Um, I even, years ago, I did music pairings for the beer because um, that was a thing for a little while in the UK, in craft beer. Um, there's a lot you can do to it. And all the beers seem to have their own personalities and their own kind of following and you can really see the difference and it's um, really exciting. And I think something we discussed before that I'm passionate about is the, the beer experience. So we have a brewery now um, and we do brewery tours, we have a tap room so you can come enjoy fresh pints uh, that have just been brewed. And I think being able to take people around, show them the equipment, talk them through the process, take samples, show them the lab, show them the ingredients, get them to hold malt and hops in their hand and smell the difference, taste the difference if they're feeling brave enough and want to eat a hop. You know, I think it just really adds that value and it really validates the product to consumers because I think a lot of people are still worried about, okay, what is alcohol free beer? Is it beer? How is it made? What's in it? Is it is it actually going to be bad for me because I'm trying to be healthier? Is it full of artificial flavorings? Some of them are, but a lot aren't and ours aren't. So it's literally completely natural ingredients. The only additional flavor we ever add is yuzu extract because, uh, you know, it's, it's a yuzu fruit. So yeah, I love that. Um, I will definitely be over to visit next time yeah, I'm in the UK. To. I love the the whole conversation around the experience. And I think what was always so surprising with for me about my journey is actually I found so much joy in sobriety. My friends and family who continue to drink have found so much joy and fun in cutting down alcohol. And that's in part because of your amazing oh, products. You. So you know, thank you um, so much for being so brave and innovative mm -hmm. and just determined to absolutely crack yeah. it. Your story and what you've done in such a short space of time is just phenomenal. And I cannot wait to see how you guys get on. Uh, I'm definitely one of your biggest cheerleaders. I've always got cans at home when I can get them in yeah. Singapore. And uh yeah, I'm just, I'm made up for you. Like, I'm so happy for you. And uh, I think your journey is incredible and it's only going to get better. I'm Thank sure. you so much for all the kind words. You know, I think owning a business is hard, but in those hard times and those dark moments, we, we try to look back at, okay, why are we doing this? Who is this helping? Why is it helping them? And that just keeps us going. So it's always really nice to hear that it's helped, even if it's just a small way. And you know, good luck with your journey and your business and uh, touching so many lives in such a positive way. It's really exciting to see. I really hope I can raise some awareness for, you know, that cutting down on alcohol doesn't have to be this miserable, lonely experience. No. You know, it can actually be really enjoyable. And I want to just raise some awareness for this incredible category that is on the rise because it's it's only going to get bigger and better. Definitely. And I think with sobriety, we kind of need to redefine it in a way and have a more individualized approach to what sobriety is. Sobriety doesn't isn't one size fits all, is it? Like for me, I don't drink at all but I'm pregnant, so I'm obviously not going to. But my- Congratulations. Yeah. So exciting. So exciting. <laughs> yes. But you know, even prior to that, to be honest, I had basically stopped and it wasn't this, it just gradually happened over time because we stopped drinking years ago and then we started drinking again, but lighter. And I've just taken these periods of months at times without drinking, just because of the options out there and just because 
my attitude has shifted and I now know how productive I can be, how good I can feel. And I just think it we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. You don't need to be sober 100% of the time. My wife, you know, she doesn't drink in the week, but she might have one or two on the weekend and she doesn't feel bad about it now. Whereas before it was like a session or it was drinks after work and it can just be very different, but still be beneficial. So I, I hope people realize that. And I think that's also some awareness that we need to raise about the category is that non-alcoholic alternatives aren't just for people who are sober. And maybe, in fact, people who do have an alcohol addiction probably should avoid the alcohol-free alternatives because they can be quite triggering. But they're really for anyone who just wants, and for whatever reason, you know, their reason is their own, but just doesn't want to drink or doesn't want to drink that night or doesn't want to drink that drink, you know, it might be that you alternate an alcohol beer and a non-alcoholic beer. And so I just think, yeah, there just definitely needs to be kind of more awareness raised for the occasion and when to drink. And that can be for anyone at any time. And uh, just to really encourage people to try them because, God, there's just some amazing products on the market and somewhere you just wouldn't know the difference. You wouldn't believe that you're not drinking alcohol. It it is crazy. Like literally one of such a small moment, but it was a big sense of achievement personally for me. We had a launch party and because most of our customers do drink, we call them flexi drinkers. So they drink, but they moderate. We do have some completely sober drinkers as well. Um, But we had alcohol on the tap. But we actually sold as much drop bear as we did alcohol, which in a big late night party with hundreds of people, we, we were not expecting. And I was speaking to people throughout the night and or the day after, they were saying, yeah, I was going to drink, but I, I like Joe Beer more. And I thought, wow, it's just the power of having a good alcohol-free product. People actually these days now can choose it just because it's nicer or they like that drink. Um, it doesn't have the alcohol doesn't necessarily always have to factor into it it's just about do I like this beer yes okay I'll have that one and um, that's exciting I love that so much that is so exciting and that is such a dream for me for the future you know that you're that people are choosing non-alcoholic alternatives the alcohol content is irrelevant they're choosing it because it genuinely tastes better I, I think about that often. I'm pretty sad like that. <laughs> no, I do too. I do too. Don't worry. I can't wait to come and visit you and, uh, and geek out about hops and learn, learn, learn more. Oh, yes. Uh, I've got lots of hops waiting for you here. Thank you so much, Joelle. I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I'm sure so many other people will as well. I hope so. I hope it's been useful and it resonates to, with other people too. Thank you so much and enjoy sunny Wales. I hope um, it gets a bit warmer for you soon. <laughs> Thank you.